The History of Poland, Episode 26, Pomerania, Part 4. Hello and welcome back. Last time we left off with a cliffhanger, wondering about this new person named Otto, who will quickly become a central character in our story of Poland and Pomerania. Now, I find Otto to be a unique person, and I really want to spend a good chunk of time focusing on his life and work. It'll be a bit of a break from the high-level view of Polish history that we've been taking, but I think we'll all agree at the end that it was worth it. So to start... How do we know anything about this Otto guy? Well, in an unusual twist, we actually have a pretty decent amount of information on him. I wouldn't call it a wealth of information, but three biographies is undoubtedly good for the time period. Now, these sources aren't unimpeachable, but they are pretty close to contemporaneous, so there's a good chance that the events they describe actually happened as they described them. Which, to be honest, is a nice shift. So, to start, who is Otto? Well, evidence points to Otto being the younger son of a Swabian noble family. Swabia, for those who don't recall, overlaps with what would be the southwest corner of modern-day Germany. So, as the younger son, Otto wasn't going to inherit his family lands when his father passed away, so he had to find his own way in the world. I mean, it's not like he was going hungry, but if he had an appetite for success or a notable career, he needed to go out and make that happen himself. And he definitely accomplished that, since almost 1,000 years later, we know a lot about Otto, but don't even know the name of his older brother. Otto's beginnings aren't as well documented as later events in his life, but the best summary I've found is by C. Stephen Yeager in the book The Origins of Courtliness. In this, Yeager describes, quote, having mastered grammar and studied the poets and philosophers, and lacking the wherewithal to continue his studies, he left Germany for Poland, where he knew there was a, quote, dearth of literate men. In Poland, he soon had learned the customs and the language so well that he passed for a native. The three major biographers gave widely differing versions of his early activities in Poland. End quote. Those differing versions of Otto's early time in Poland give the impression that A. No one knows with absolute certainty what he was up to, but that B. Whatever he did, everyone at the time was impressed with it. He may have run a school, he may have been the equivalent of an arbitrator, or he was just a trusted listening board for nobles. Personally, I see him filling in that niche that you see in a lot of novels. You know, the educated character with the big library that the protagonist goes to in a pinch, there receiving the key information that the otherwise wouldn't have known, solving the problems they're facing. Now, that's probably not the case, but it's how I picture Otto during this time in Poland, what with its lack of learned men. There are a couple of things to note during these early years in Poland. First, there's speculation that Otto may have been a tutor of young Boleslavs. Second, that Otto appears to have mastered the local dialect to the point that he spoke it as if a native, helping him to win over the locals. Finally, that he wasn't just giving sermons, but that he was active in both the domestic and foreign political affairs of the Polish state. While it's not clear what his day-to-day -day life looked like, one thing that is clear is that his relationship with Władysław and his wife Judith put him in close proximity to Henry IV, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. You see, Judith would routinely use Otto as her messenger back to her brother Henry. During these missions, on which he was laden with gifts from Judith to her brother, Otto apparently came to know Henry quite well. Like he had with the rulers of Poland, he came to impress the emperor. Eventually, despite the high role that Otto had attained in Poland, he was called by the emperor to serve in the imperial court. A good step up, I'd say. In fact, he became the equivalent of the emperor's private secretary and chancellor, with a great deal of power placed into his evidently capable hands. From that role, he was then vaulted even higher and made the Bishop of Bamberg. In that position, Otto accrued great wealth and power, and became one of the most powerful men in the empire, and by extension, one of the most powerful men in Europe. As bishop, he was pulled into the investiture controversy, in which he sided with the empire rather than the church. Now, one day, as the Bishop of Bamberg, Otto received a visitor named Bernard. Bernard had just come back from an attempted missionary journey into Pomerania, which had been supported by Boleslav III, but which did not go well. No, on this missionary journey, Bernard reportedly showed up in all humility, wearing the poorest of clothes, and then proceeded to tell the Pomeranians that he served a mighty god. The Pomeranians, though, were evidently distracted by his clothing, and essentially asked, well, if your god is so powerful, why are you wearing such poor clothing? And why don't you have shoes on? Come on, man. Bernard didn't have a great answer for this, unfortunately, and seems to have forgotten to quote the number of scriptures that would have answered this particular challenge. Either that or the Pomeranians didn't care for his answer. In their eyes, no one who had a choice would show up in such poor clothing. In fact, the impression of his poverty was comically so strong that Bernard believed that the Pomeranians thought he had showed up not as an emissary of God, but as a beggar looking to make some money. Unsurprisingly, things went south and he was tossed out. 
His takeaway was that the Pomeranians he went to speak to were so obsessed with material wealth that they would only respond to someone if they showed up and were clearly wealthy. This was the message he told Boleslav, to which Boleslav and the rest of the Polish clergy essentially said, yeah, we told you that before you went north, and which Bernard then told to Otto. Otto took it to heart, but didn't immediately act on it. Then in 1124, Otto received a message from the Duke of Poland, a familiar character, Boleslav III. As it's recorded for us, it said, quote, to the venerable Bishop Otto, his lord and beloved father Boleslav, the Duke of Polonia proffers his filial respect and humble devotion. For as much as I remember that in the days of thy youth, thou didst live at my father's court in honor and credit, and for as much as the Lord is now with thee strengthening and blessing thee in all thy ways, if it be agreeable to thee, I desire to renew our former friendship and to make use of thy counsel and assistance, so that by the help of his grace we may promote the glory of God. For thou knowest, I think, how the rude barbarians in Pomerania who have been brought low, not by my power, but by the power of God, are now seeking to be admitted into the church by the washing of baptism. For three years I have been striving without result, because I cannot induce any bishops or suitable priests near at hand to undertake the work. On this account, and because thy readiness to undertake all good works is well known, I pray, beloved Father, that it may please thee with our humble assistance to undertake this task for the glory of God and the increase of thy happiness. I, Thy devoted servant will provide all expenses and companions for the journey, both interpreters and assistant priests, and whatever else is needed if you, Holy Father, will deign to come. End quote. Otto responded enthusiastically to this call and began preparations for his first journey into Pomerania, a Pomerania that had just recently been conquered. But what was the political and religious landscape that Otto was walking into? Well, the best account I've found comes from Robert Bartlett's work, The Conversion of a Pagan Society in the Middle Ages. Bartlett goes into great detail on Pomerania as a whole, but we'll pull from three main areas, the rulers, the priests, and local religion. First, Bartlett tells us about the local religion, saying, quote, At this time, the early 12th century, Pomerania formed part of the last stronghold of European paganism, the lands around the southern and eastern shores of the Baltic Sea. Everywhere else in Europe and the Mediterranean, the monotheistic religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, predominated. These kindred faiths, spreading from their common Near Eastern homeland, had, over the course of the first millennium or so, reached regions as diverse and distant as Iceland and Spain, Ireland and Russia. By the early 12th century, although, of course, some pagan practices still survived among the baptized population of Europe, there were only a few regions where a public pagan cult was possible. In the South Russian steppes, Eurasian peoples like the Kuman maintained the pagan religion they had brought west with them, but a native European paganism survived only among the Bates and the Slavs of the Baltic Basin. Here, local, non-literate, polytheistic cults still flourished in the 12th century. End quote. Second, Bartlett tells us of the rulers and their incredible wealth and uniquely powerful position, saying, quote, These towns were dominated by wealthy and powerful men, equally at home in the business of maritime trade or piracy. Individual oligarchs had huge numbers of retainers and dependents, and were able, on their own account, to launch freelance piratical raids. Together, they exercised a semi-autonomous authority in the trading cities. As a 10th century Jewish trader observed of them, they have no king and permit no one man to rule them, but power is exercised among them by their elders. End quote. Then, in greater detail, Bartlett explains the pagan priests and their way of worship, saying, quote, The vested interest most clearly involved with the pagan religion was the pagan priesthood. A professional priesthood was a feature of West Slav paganism, and there were rewards, both in material terms and in terms of power and status, for members of this sacerdotal caste. No evidence survives of the endowment of pagan temples or the pagan priesthood, although the existence of such endowment is highly plausible, but there is explicit evidence both for the wealth of the temples and for large revenues from offerings and tithes. The temple buildings were often elaborate. This chief temple of Sichechen was of wonderfully skillful construction, with carving on the inside and outside. Projecting from the walls were images of men, birds, beasts, carved in such a lifelike manner that you would think they breathed and lived. Another remarkable thing was that they had been painted so skillfully that the colors of the carvings on the outside were resistant to storms of snow and rain. The temple at Guchko was a recent construction of great beauty and wonderful skill, which had cost the inhabitants 300 talents. Not only the buildings themselves, but the idols inside them too were ornate and expensive. Golden idols like that of the god Turglaus at Shichechen, golden weapons and golden saddles for the gods, represented a vast concentration of capital in such a society. One side effect of Otto's mission was the release of this capital back into circulation, since what was given up to the service of demons was now turned over to the use of men. The capital accumulated in the buildings, the images, and the vessels of the pagan temples was constantly augmented by offerings. Some of these were regulated. 
For example, a tenth of the spoils of raiding and piracy was offered to Triglaus's temple by the men of Sichichen. Other offerings were voluntary and occasional, such as a coin offered for safe delivery from shipwreck. At Guchko, the idols were offered food and drink daily. Revenues of this kind provided important support for the priesthood and temples of Pomeranian paganism. Even at a very humble level, the offering associated with pagan practices could be vital. On his second mission tour in 1128, Otto very nearly had his head split open but for the custodian of a sacred nut tree. This poor little man relied on the tree for his livelihood, not only upon the nuts presumably, but also upon the sacrifices which were offered there. In all these ways, a priestly or sub-priestly caste, ranging from the powerful priests of Suchechen to the custodians of the sacred tree, were supported economically and privileged socially through its connection with Pomeranian paganism. Christian missionaries came to destroy these sources of revenue or to divert them to their own purposes and to end the life of this caste. It is not at all surprising that some of the most tenacious and violent opposition came from these wicked priests filled with demons. End quote. So that's the landscape Otto is walking into. Resistance from the political caste, resistance from the religious society, and resistance from the priestly caste. And that's the landscape we'll pick up with next time. As always, thank you for listening. If you'd like to help support the creation of this podcast, you can donate at patreon.com slash history of Poland podcast. If you can't spare the change, you can always leave a review on the various podcast apps or follow along on social media by searching for the History of Poland podcast. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.